two kinds of learning are classical conditioning and operant conditioning. In classical conditioning, you learn a reflexive reaction to a stimulus. So if a dog bites you, you learn to be afraid of dogs. If a dog is nice to you, if you have fun with dogs, you learn to like dogs. This was studied by Ivan Pavlov, sometimes called Pavlovian conditioning. He's famous for teaching dogs to drool when they hear a bell, for example. The other kind of learning is called operant conditioning. This is when we learn to move our body. We, le we learn movements because of the consequences. So we learn to play guitar, we learn to ride a bike, we learn to type on a keyboard and so on. This video is about operant conditioning. In operant conditioning, we learn to have a behavior more often or less often in a given situation, depending upon the consequences of that behavior. So the behavior that is learned is called an operant behavior and the consequences are called reinforcers. There's a scene from the TV show, The Office, which is quite commonly used as an example of classical conditioning. In fact, it's not classical conditioning, it's operant conditioning. Uh, the man learns to reach out his hand when he hears a computer sound because he gets candy. So we call the candy a reinforcer. The movement of the hand is an operant behavior. Operant conditioning is one of the most powerful things you can learn. Uh, it's hugely powerful in changing behavior. If you want to increase somebody's behavior, compliment them. Make sure that they receive a consequence right away that is pleasant. One of the first people to study operant conditioning was American psychologist Edward Thorndike, who actually called it instrumental learning or instrumental conditioning when he studied this process way back in the early 1900s. Thorndike built these weird boxes he called puzzle boxes in which he would place an animal like a cat. And he had developed this box in a way that there was a mechanism for the cat to escape. And he would time how long it took for the cat to escape. And then he would have some food treat for the cat outside the box. Here we see a cat in a puzzle box. And what Thorndike did is timed very carefully how long it took the cat to get out. And at first the cat just did trial and error until he finally got out, so it took a long time. But then he, Thorndike put the cat back in the puzzle box and the cat got out faster. In fact, each time Thorndike put the cat back in the puzzle box, the cat got out faster and faster. And Thorndike kept very careful records of it. So he had the first example of the learning curve. What Thorndike was demonstrating is that an animal could learn by experience. And the experience was consequence. That when the cat tried a certain behavior and it worked at getting out of the box to get the food, that behavior became more common for the cat. That is called in today an operant behavior. And the process is called the law of effect. Thorndike discovered what he called the law of effect, that the consequence or the effect of a behavior makes it more common. So the, this law of effect means that if an animal does a certain behavior, and that means humans too, and the, and the result is pleasant, that our brain learns to do that behavior more often. The other side of the law of effect, if we have a behavior and the consequence is unpleasant, our brain learns don't do that. It's easy to discover for yourself the power of the law of effect. If a behavior is followed by something pleasant, that behavior becomes more common. For example, if you're having a conversation with somebody, at any random moment, give them a big compliment. What you'll discover is more likely than not, they will repeat whatever it is that they said just before the compliment. So the compliment acts as a reinforcer, a, a pleasant consequence for whatever it was that they just said. Give them a big, oh my gosh, you're so great. You're such a good storyteller. Oh, I just love the way you say that. They will repeat what they just said. Try it sometime. You'll discover how powerful operant conditioning is. 
the person who is most famous for studying operant conditioning and the person who gave it its name, operant conditioning, was a psychologist named B.F. Skinner, who later became the most influential psychologist in history, even surpassing Sigmund Freud, who, by the way, wasn't a psychologist. He was a medical doctor. Here are some pictures of B.F. Skinner, including a picture of him in his laboratory with what is called a Skinner box. These are operant conditioning apparatuses that were invented by B.F. Skinner in order to measure and test animal behavior. And in this case, operant conditioning. And Skinner determined uh, all of the terminology that we use today for, for operant conditioning. Here are two photos of B.F. Skinner, one in which uh, he, is, he is seen with one of his favorite animals, the pigeon, which he often used in his research. In fact, he trained pigeons to inspect pills for a pill company, and he also trained pigeons to fly uh, guided missiles during World War II. Here is an illustration of the major components of a Skinner box. A Skinner box is used to to control very accurately uh, and measure the behavior of the animal. Here is another illustration of a Skinner box, which allows for some behavior. In the case of a rat, we have a little lever or bar that the animal can push down. We have some kind of stimulus, like a sound or a light, that tells the animal when they should do this behavior. And then we have what we call a reinforcer. It might be food. It might be a mild electric shock. It might be something pleasant. It might be something unpleasant. And then we use this to measure behavior and find out the laws of behavior. Here is a photo of a rat, another favorite uh, research animal by psychologists in a Skinner box. He's exploring around and eventually he will learn when the light goes on, if he pushes the bar, some food will be delivered. Here is a pigeon in a Skinner box who has learned that when he pecks at this disc or key that he will get food. Uh, sometimes we make the pigeon peck a certain number of times in order to get the food. Skinner was able to show the power of operant conditioning by teaching animals to do all kinds of fun behaviors. For example, here are some birds playing basketball. And in this example of operant conditioning, uh, we see some pigeons who Skinner taught to play ping pong. And the way this works on this little ping pong table is when a, a, a pigeon misses the ball, the other pigeon gets some food. So a shot by a pigeon that makes it past the other pigeon is reinforced with food. Here we see a rat in a Skinner box. When the light goes on, the rat pushes a bar and then gets some food. Here's the terminology that we use. The light going on is called a discriminative stimulus. When the rat pushes down on the bar, that is called an operant behavior or a response. Uh, and then the food comes along, that is called the reinforcer. We have symbols that we use to represent each of these components of operant conditioning. The light going on, the discriminative stimulus is called an SD. D is in the upper right hand corner, a superscript. Uh, for the reinforcer, we use S with an R. This is the reinforcing stimulus. And then the response is just the letter R. That's the operant behavior. A simple example of operant conditioning that we call positive reinforcement. It's called positive because in this case, the child is going to get something. Positive means uh, receiving something, adding something. And it's called reinforcement because his behavior will increase. So little Taro smiles, that's an operant behavior. His father picks him up when he smiles. He enjoys that, he likes it, it's pleasant, that is a reinforcer, and his behavior will increase, especially when his father is around because his father is the discriminative stimulus that tells his brain, now's a good time to smile and you'll get picked up. So his behavior goes up, that's the law of effect.
In operant conditioning, timing is super important. How well a behavior will be learned is highly dependent upon the timing. The sooner, the better. Here's a funny cartoon. Harold, the dog's trying to blow up the house again. Catch him in the act or he'll never learn. That's a cartoon about timing. B.F. Skinner said, the way positive reinforcement is carried out is more important than the amount. By the way it's carried out, he's referring really to the timing. When a behavior occurs, the reinforcer should come right away in order to influence that behavior. We have four different types of operant conditioning. The terminology is rather difficult, so let's start here. When a behavior occurs, an operant behavior, there are four possible consequences. You can, for example, with a rat in a Skinner box, when he pushes the bar, you could add food, or maybe you could subtract food, take some food away from the animal, or maybe you could add an electric shock or an unpleasant stimulus, or you could turn off, take away some unpleasant stimulus that's already there. So these are the four things that could happen that would influence the frequency of the behavior. We have terminology for each of these I'm going to show you next. Here is a chart that shows the four types of operant conditioning. At the top, we have the positive reinforcer means something that's pleasant, and the negative reinforcer means something unpleasant. Either of these can either be added to the situation after the operant behavior, the response, or they can be subtracted after the response. So a rat in a Skinner box pushes the bar. We could give the rat some food. This is called positive reinforcement. It's called positive because you're adding something. It's called reinforcement because it strengthens. It makes the behavior more common. Reinforce means to strengthen. If, on the other hand, the rat pushes the bar and we give the rat an electric shock, we have added something. So that process is called positive. But the rat does not want to push that bar anymore. That is called punishment. Sorry about the use of the word punishment here, because in, in general language, punishment means something uh, quite different. But here we mean that the behavior will decrease because the consequence was unpleasant. Now, we also have what is called negative punishment. For example, if the rat pushes the bar, we take some food away from him. It's called negative because you're subtracting something. So negative punishment it could be thought of as subtraction, weakening. The behavior becomes weaker. Uh, the punishment is the word that's used for that. And then finally, there's negative reinforcement, which is the most complicated. This is when you remove something. It's called negative, meaning you're removing a stimulus after the behavior, but it's pleasant to the person. So for example, if the rat is in the Skinner box and the shock is on, and he, the rat pushes the bar and you reduce the shock or remove the shock, that's pleasant. So that's called negative reinforcement. It's called negative because you're removing something. It's called reinforcement because it strengthens the behavior. Negative reinforcement is the same as escape. We try to escape from things that we don't like, uh, and then we learn those escape behaviors. So a child might learn to say, I'm sorry, in order to get a parent to stop scolding them. How can you remember those four different terminologies for four different types of operant conditioning? Well, here's the easy way to do it. When you think about an operant conditioning situation, here I'm showing the paradigm for operant conditioning. What you should do first is look at the consequence, the reinforcer, and ask if something was added or if something was taken away. If something was added, the process has to be called positive. If something was taken away, the process is called negative. Then the second thing to do is look at what happened to the behavior. Did the behavior increase? If so, the process is called reinforcement. Did the behavior decrease, become less likely? If so, that's called punishment. Okay, we've come to the end of our video on operant conditioning. I hope you learned a little bit about that process, and thank you for your interest in it, and thank you for watching my video. Please subscribe to my channel, Brucey, and watch some of my other videos. I'm psychologist Bruce Heinrichs. Bye.